Hello, everyone. I would like uh, at this point to invite another person on the stage, which is Lukáš Medek, because it's not very common that you can see the whole development studio at one place in one conference. So this is Lukáš Medek, the second half of CB Software. He will be today here with me, helping with some organizing uh, of this lecture, and also he will have his uh, uh, talks. Uh, and uh, I would also like to uh, thank Pavel for inviting us here and this uh, to this really incredible place. As a mu musician, I can really appreciate this. And let's start because today I am going to talk about uh, how we managed to survive as two developers uh, for so many years and create games and don't give up. So that's basically the talk. Maybe it can be even inspiring for someone who is not decided yet. Uh, so, as, I to, as, as you saw, we are independent two-man studio. We are kind of uh, pretty much uh, self-funding ourselves and uh, we are just doing what we like to do. And uh, we are kind of working together since 2003, uh, which, uh, as you might uh, know, that it's 13 years already and uh, it takes a lot of patience and kind of tolerance not to slaughter each other during such a long time. You know, lot of lots of marriages and way earlier than our CB software. Uh, to this day, we published five commercial games and one freeware game. Uh, and also, what we did is we cooperated with Sensecape and other indie developers on a, a kind of interesting uh, game, which is an experiment in narrative, in kind of uh, non-linear narrative called Serena, which is free, so you can also uh, play this game. And uh, during the time, we survived also because we kind of learned how to avoid shady contracts, shady publishers, and this kind of leads us to this very day because even today we got so many incredible things in our mailboxes, like offers you can't resist, that uh, it's absolutely stunning. And we still didn't give up, so let's uh, start uh, with what we do and uh, how we split our roles. Uh, so I'm Jan Kavan, I, what I do in our team is that I write, I program the thing, I do game and level design, I do music and sound effects, and I do social media. And here is one kind of uh, interesting maybe point, because I am a composer by trade. I've studied uh, music composition, I also currently teach music composition at uh, Academy, uh, Janáček Academy of Performing Arts in Brno. And my uh, kind of uh, sphere of interest is uh, uh, non-linear music, interactive music, adaptive music. So I'm doing this kind of stuff. I'm teaching this kind of stuff. And it was one of the points when I wanted to go to game industry because this is exactly the medium. If you see a pixel in our game or animation in our game or interface in our game, it's all his work. And apart from that, he also contributes to story and we are uh, kind of very much uh, cooperating on everything, so it's not like split role, but we really are trying to follow one one mission. We are trying to go together to s basically in one direction. So at this point, I would like Lukash to uh, just make some some visual break. Maybe it will even work. What you will see is a trailer from the, our last uh, game we published commercially. Uh, so it's Julia Among the Stars. Some of you might have heard about it. I might try. Greetings, Rachel Manners. Please exit the cryo chamber and proceed immediately to the main deck.
I'm activating Mobot's exploration mode. Okay, let's leave this place. down the possibilities with these wires. You're saying they fired on sight? We need to stay focused, Rachel. You're the last surviving member of the expedition, and you need to finish what you've started. So that was the uh, trailer for the game, which we, as you saw, published in uh, September 2014. And since then, we've been kind of silent. So maybe we'll say something about that. Let's just get the presentation back on tracks. <sighs> OK. Okay, so I would like to start to talk a bit uh, about the price of an indie development or YCB is just two people, because this is very often misunderstood by many people, what are actually costs, even for such a small studio as we are, what are costs of uh, teams which are doing mobile games and everybody kind of have the idea that it's, or a lot of people have the idea that it's just, you know, you do something in your bedroom and you can do it in your bedroom, but when you are 40 and you have your family and you have to pay your rent and everything, it's no longer such an easy task. So I would like to show you a little model like a, like a hypothetical alternative reality when this Julia Among the Stars would have been done by a really tiny team. So let's just say we have one game designer, we have two programmers, three graphic artists, one animator, and we outsource accountant, writer, voiceovers, sound effects, and music. Plus, we of course have to kind of pay for rent, IT, servers, you know, hardware, software, etc. Et so we uh, don't do any PR, we don't do any marketing, we don't go to conventions, we just develop. And just a funny reminder, we did for Julia Among the Stars a little crowdfunding campaign, which uh, brought us $14,000. Eventually, uh, it means that for the development, it's like eight and a half thousand dollars because uh, you have to pay for the PayPal, you have to pay for the crowdfunding site, you have to pay for the rewards, for the postage and blah, blah. So basically, that's what's, what's happening with the money. So let me see. If we have been kind of uh, standard paid people, not kind of industry triple A standard paid, but normally paid monthly salary, including the rent, the cost of the game would be 234,000 euros. If we go half the price and let's say, okay, we just, you know, need uh, half of the money, still it's uh, over 100 uh, or almost 120,000 euros, which is a lot of money. And the uh, problem is that uh, we didn't have so much money and not many people, if you don't go to bank, ask for the money, you don't get that much money. So that's what the costs really are. You can see that we made the Julia Among the Stars despite the size. We made it in uh, 18 months, which is also kind of our kind of record because uh, normally such a game would take much more time to do. And we made, uh, we made it uh, with a little bit 
un, uh, something over 50,000 euros, to, which, which is kind of final cost. But the trick was that I uh, basically have a money job, like a regular money job, and I didn't have any money for myself, so that's why the costs went so down. And this is another view on the same uh, kind of uh, problem, and this is the, the sale the sale platform significance, which in case of Julia, where basically the main kind of pressure on our studio was from the people who have Mac and from uh, people who have Linux, that you can see that uh, they are not really that signi significant. I am evaluating here two years of sales, and uh, we are very happy with the sales, but basically you can see that, th that Mac and Linux, despite the costs, which were over three months, to make the port to those two platforms were not really worth it. So basically, as a small studio, we are often asked, why your game is not on, I don't know, Nintendo? Why is not on Linux? Why, why it's not on Macintosh? And basically, this is the reason, because if you count three months of our work, you get two horrible numbers, and uh, we also don't have to maybe have them. The same goes with localization. We did Julia Among the Stars. We localized it to German language. And to this date, it barely pays the localization, despite the claims of people that if it would be in German, it would work, it would be perfect. The same goes, for example, with good old games. Everybody was, yeah, we are blocking your game, we are not buying your game, but as soon as you put it on good old games, we will buy it. Obviously, uh, again, the market shows otherwise. So this is our point that usually, as a small team with no kind of reserve, we have to focus what really matters, and then we ha when we have some reserve, we can go on. But anyway, I'm going to leave the money now, and uh, I will uh, try to say how it works with our studio, because it might be totally different with different studios, but this is what works with us. First of all, we never have the ambition to have our own engine, uh, because uh, it would be very hard to maintain, and it's kind of entirely different uh, way if you have one programmer, it's, it's not possible to have your own engine, like develop engine and develop game and do whatever. So if you want to make engine, make engine, but it's not something which uh, you basically uh, can, uh, can manage to basically bring games on the market this way. What we did is we progressed from Torx 3D, which was our kind of purgatory. It was a nightmare working with this engine. Then for many, many years, we worked with the uh, Czech uh, Wintermute engine, which is kind of engine uh, customized for adventure games. And we uh, kind of published many games with Wintermute engine. I also helped with many other Wintermute engine projects. And what actually happens with Wintermute is that at certain point in time, and it was production of Julia Among the Stars, it became uh, open source, so I had to kind of over overtake the development and create my own fork, so I was basically, at the end of the day, for Julia Among the Stars, making my own version of the, of the engine. We also experimented with Unity, and now we landed with Unreal 4, which is kind of uh, the engine of our choice uh, with, this, uh, with this game we are now working on. Another thing which is kind of necessary, even if you are two people, is to have a good versioning and collaboration environment. Basically, you never want to know, to uh, want to lose data. You never want to kind of have uh, uh, some document or some hard drive and not accessible to the other person. So it's something you really have to prepare to have everything as flexible as possible. Uh, ah, stop working. Another thing is that uh, when you are two and you also have your money job and you also have other tasks, you tend to be distracted and you have to definitely find some way how to uh, find uh, some flow in your development. Otherwise, it can get stuck and suddenly two months are over and you don't know where they went. So what we actually are using is a combination of a Scrum methodology and Kanban chart, but we basically have our own methodology, which is not uh, strict Scrum or strict Kanban. We are using some combination, and we use it only when it matters. So we also have some prototyping periods where we don't have to use it because it doesn't make any sense. And also, what is very important is to, from the beginning, really test and choose a proper content creation tool, so like a graphic packages, audio hardware, software, programming environment, etc. So basically, you, if you are just two, you have to s 
save as much time as possible. And it's not only about, uh, for example, having, if you are using Unity, for example, using ReSharper, if you are using uh, Unreal, using uh, Visual Assist or Incredible, but it's also about the whole kind of infrastructure. You need to save as much time as possible, otherwise it's not possible. And of course, the most important part of the indie development is to have a good coffee machine. Because if your coffee machine breaks, the development is over. That's end, you know, you can go home, no more games. And the same goes with the people, uh, because uh, first of all, in especially Czech and, Slo uh, uh, and Slovakia, the laws are such a horrible mess, and now spiced with you, uh, European Union, Vetmos, and stuff like this, that if you don't have a good accountant, you're lost. You can make game, you can even sell it, and then they come for you and that's end. So basically you need, this is like a point number one, And another thing is that uh, basically we target on English market. This is like m our major major market. So it's not about going and finding some native speaker if you are doing story-driven games like we, but you need to have a writer, somebody who understands not only the syntax, not only the kind of uh, grammar, but somebody who knows what flows, what's kind of good. So basically we have a long, long-term relationship with Laura McDonald from and uh, I don't know, uh, we worked together since 2002, even before CBE. So uh, that's, that's basically uh, what is important. Uh, otherwise, your game can be really great and people will totally trash it for bad language, for something which doesn't flow well. And also having a dedicated PR helps a lot. Uh, somebody who understands, and if you send your emails, somebody who can actually read them, because that's, that's the thing. Uh, if I send my emails, a lot of them are ending in mail filters, in spam and whatever. If you have somebody who is known as a PR person, it really helps a lot because their mails are much more kind of uh, readable. And also knowing what to outsource, because the biggest mistake we made at the beginning is that we were like, yeah, let's do it everything ourselves, we will save a lot of money and let's just, you know, make it. Eventually, we spent much more time trying to fiddle with stuff we didn't understand, and if we now out outsource these things, it's much more cheaper in, uh, in the kind of terms of production time. Okay. And what is kind of very strange in our environment here is that uh, a lot of people are coming to us and saying, no, you, you won't be able to do it, you can't do it, you know, it's, it's nonsense, you know, two people can't make game and you don't have money and it will be stupid and bad anyway. And what we kind of also tried is to prove them wrong, so we tried to create something despite all this saying and all the negativity which is kind of everywhere around us now. So we had the harsh beginnings. Uh, our first game called Ghost in the Sheet was a game where we learned ourselves how to really make a game. And we were always working on a game, but with Ghost in the Sheet, it was the game which ended on the market. And this is a big difference. You can work for ages on game, but if you don't release it and don't have the feedback, it's just, you know, it's just a concept. So having like an intro screen and closing credits and having it, ha having it out there, even in the box and in many languages, uh, it was very important, but it was not that well received. And for fun, we will just show you a bit from our first game to see so you can compare with uh, our current journey. Okay. This should give me enough leverage. Done. It looks like... That's it. Oops. The first good thing... Playing as a ghost, so you can manipulate only with paranormal skills. Off we go. Hmm. 
Looking from up here, I'm not surprised that Hansen jumped off the cable car. It would be interesting to see how I'd be able to glide down on the sheet. But I'm not going to try that since I haven't a clue how to get back up. I think we can end this short example how it started in 2007 when we released this game. And uh, as I told you, for me this game is uh, very, very important, not in terms of the quality of I don't think it's some stellar game, but we had a lot of fun doing it and we basically learned all the processes from the very beginning to the very end. And this is for me, uh, everybody should have such a small kind of uh, game, even if it's not super, to just learn the ropes. Okay. So we have some tiny success. Uh, this game was absolutely popular in Russia and in Greece. This was two countries which loved Ghost. And we have a funny, also another funny story with Germany where they marketed this comedy game as a horror game. They rename it to Scare and put some really ugly, uh, some face, some really broken face on the cover and try to sell it as a horror. And people were really very angry that they are not afraid in this comedy game. And uh, what happens next is that uh, Ghost was over and we were trying to come with a different format with the game called Julia, which is not the Julia Among the Stars we showed you, but it was an old version of Julia when we worked for, I don't know, three, four years on a game. And uh, we signed exclusive publishing contract with a publisher called Lace Mamba Global, which was back then the thing. And what happens, you know, the open letter from Amanita Design, from Colibri Games, from Dedalic, because Lace Mamba Global were just stealing money and they were just, you know, uh, they were not reporting. And basically, we didn't get any money from the game, despite the sales all around the world. So uh, what, we ha what happened is that we were really depressed and we say, okay, it, it's not worth it because, you know, three years of work and it was, you know, basically you can have a contract, you can, and then you, go to lawyers and we paid 5,000 pounds for lawyers just to get rights back from this publishing contract despite the fact that they really seriously breached the contract. So that's the reality. And what happens next that we got this great idea that we will change genres and create a game called Vampires Guide Them to Safety which was a puzzle, kind of funny puzzle game. And uh, it was really great because then we uh, lost another year of development time and money and this was like a total bankruptcy. Maybe it would be fun if we show you the vampire trailer just to see what we are trying to do.
So basically, that was our that was our encounter with the mobile market. And this is basically uh, when we believed that the mobile market would uh, save us, which didn't because our, I don't know, $100 or $200 we made from this game back then was uh, really uh, kind of off-putting for us. But uh, on the other hand, because we already had uh, quite a few games there and we already cooperated on other games, uh, we We've been starting asked about by different publishers, mainly from Germany. So it was the time when we were kind of to create two prototypes for games for two companies, which they swear to give us money to fund us because it, they were really into this idea. So we were traveling around, we were going to Hamburg, taking the trains, again paying the costs and whatever. And uh, we created two prototypes of a games, which uh, basically at certain point either the publisher was going under, or they suddenly say no, you have to turn adventure game to free to play experience and whatever. So this is basically when we just spent another yet another year to um, to just you know throw our resources, throw away the money we didn't already have at this point. Fortunately for us, we did some contracts, uh, non-gaming contracts, so we had the more money to throw away. And uh, But what happened after this, and I will show you later maybe some of the old stuff, uh, but uh, I want to move forward, is that uh, we uh, made a crowdfunding campaign for Julia Among the Stars, which was just my kind of final cry. I was saying, okay, let's just fix the things which were not working in Julia. We already get our rights back and let's call it quits, so let's make a two months long project. And what happens is we asked for uh, $5,000, we got $14,000 and we decided to reboot the game, make like a like reimagination of the game, totally change all the mechanics and make, make it a different. So that's what basically kept us afloat. And uh, despite all the people where we're coming and say, you know, it's no, it, it really doesn't make sense and just, you know, leave it. Uh, the Julia Among the Stars happened and it became a successful game. So that's, that's what was our turning point in our development. Uh, I am talking too much, so I'm inviting Lukáš here and he will tell you something from his perspective about advantages of our tiny team. Hey, hello. So that's my bit of talking. Uh, so as just Honza said, we are just two people, so uh, there are some advantages of working in such a small team. So the first and uh, basic one, there is no one above us, no producers, no, uh, no uh, CEOs, and no other people who uh, tell us what to do and what not to do. Uh, so we are kind of free, uh, free to work on uh, on what we want and uh, some kind of like uh, our uh, schedule our time as we want and so on. So that's the first and basic uh, basic positivum of this. Oops, I just yep. Uh, as we are two, we we, we can uh, very quickly. Uh, decide what uh, we want to on or what we don't want to. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, really fast. You don't have to go through uh, some departments of approval and and so on. We got uh, only just feedbacks from from our testers and so on. So uh, that's a great thing too. Uh, we don't have to uh, send our stuff to Shanghai or or India to uh, to approve uh, or don't. So that that's great too. Uh, no producers. That's a good thing, always, I think. Uh, and uh, the next one, yeah, I, I just want to talk about uh, free crea creativity. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ideas and a lot of uh, things we want to do, and uh, we always have to like, decide uh, what, what uh, time we have and uh, how long it will take to uh, create some uh, some cool uh, feature in the game and uh, we are we are completely free on this so it's great and it's bad at the same time because uh, we always think uh, too high and then we uh, just have to lower uh, our expe ex expectation uh, due to uh, our capacities only of only of me and me and Jan and of course, as we are sitting uh, and facing each other in one office, uh, we have very quick 
decision decision times. So that's that's very cool too. And uh, as Honza do all the all the stuff and I do all the graphics, it's it's uh, really really cool and easy uh, to be consistent in our art uh, because because there is no one uh, uh, who is messing with the with the project and stuff. So and that's basically that's basically it because yeah we are very satisfied to work uh, such a long time uh, together and we hope that we will like continue for a long time and uh, what about price the production is much cheaper because you have to pay uh, only well one people because uh, Jan, Jan do all the stuff for free uh, so I'm the only uh, paid person in our in our company so it's not bad too okay I'm hand the microphone back to Jan we are slowly running out of time, so I'm going to speed. So it will be like a very linear progression with the speed to time. Uh, I would like to say uh, also that not everything is uh, purple and shiny and unicorn. And uh, there are disadvantages as well. Basically, we constantly struggle for money. And uh, we have a very tight dependency. So basically, we've been both in the hospital now and for different reasons and uh, it means like three weeks of uh, kind of delay which is very significant if you know how the development works and we like a third pair of eyes we of course use our friends or kind of people from industry to look in what we are doing but it's not enough if you kind of have to deal day to day de uh, kind of decide uh, this lack of third, third pair of eyes can be sometimes very hard and we need to make a lot of compromises and we need to shield from people who are saying, yeah, but this animation sucks and this is not nice and this texture is blurred and, and this, this uh, sound effect should be a bit different. I know, we know it. We know it more than you. But problem is that uh, we have to make compromises, otherwise there is no game. We can strive for perfection, but we don't have money for AAA production, we don't have $65 million for a game. So that's, that's the thing. We just have to make compromise and make the game as best as we can. And we don't have free time and we don't have real nights, especially in my case, uh, I end up usually with development at 4 a.m. and I'm waking at 7, so that's basically the indie life. Uh, another thing is that it requires a really broad range of skills. So as you saw, our skill set is split quite evenly, but it's something you have to acquire over the time. And uh, another thing is that there is a real stress uh, because there is, if you make game, there is a lot of tasks and some are kind of big, some are kind of small, but you need to make them all. And it can look very daunting if you look at this huge list of things to do. And of course, if the game won't sell enough, it's game over for the company. You don't have any backup games. We, at this point we do, but uh, when you start, you don't have anything. So basically it's like yes or no, if you make it at least decently kind of uh, 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 your, your investment back, then you survive. If not, that's, that's game over. Okay. And another thing is that uh, you can do uh, more things in parallel. Basically, we are working now on one game and we can work on two games or start with localization of Julia into Russian, for example. Because we are working on a game, we have schedule and we have to stick to it. Okay, so I would like to present a couple of lessons and then we will show you a trailer from the thing which we work on now. And uh, then it will be QA because the time is already very short. So, uh, if you want to start with a, such a tiny team, you want to be one, two persons, three persons, first of all, discipline is crucial. You have to be really organized. There is no time for uh, some bullshit in a way that you would just disappear, you would not kind of deliver. Otherwise, everything goes down the drain and people get progressively less interested, which is the main problem. I've seen so many interesting projects in all the years. I've seen so many beautiful games, all of them just, you know, fall down because of the interest curve. People stop being interested. They are not disciplined or enough. Another thing is that if you are a small team, you can't afford to redo the whole game. So basically think about preparation, about the mechanics of the game and make it so you can always decompose it. You can always remove it. You can always change it a bit. Otherwise, you're lost. You 
basically have to focus on microscopic details of the systems you are using in the game. So you never get in the way that, okay, if I remove this system, the whole, the whole game stops working. And of course, build the first iteration as fast as possible using gray boxing, basically meaning using simple graphics, using simple system, just schematically things, or making a paper prototypes. Just put it away as fast as possible to understand that the game is working or not. And if not, then you should make another game or change it completely. And think about the constant change because, you know, on the paper, it looks well, but if you start playing it, it's boring. Why? So you need to think about this change, think about how it can evolve which requires a lot of learning and patience. You have to really study. You have to be into the mechanics. You have to really be very careful with this. And, uh, hmm? what? Ah, okay. and another funny part, which is kind of uh, specific to Unreal, is that uh, you always have to change many, many things in the game because uh, the, every version of Unreal is changing a lot of internal things. So you have to reprogram lots of stuff. You, uh, lots of classes are changed. A Lo lot of blueprints you have to redo. So basically, not only kind of internal change in terms of game design, but also like uh, externally forced change uh, because of the versions. And uh, one important thing is that you absolutely have to make a good development pipeline to even start. So basically, think about how it works, uh, how, uh, how the parallel process is, what can be done by the visual artist, what can be done by me, how to connect it in the more eff most effective way possible. So finding a pipeline, finding the ways how to import stuff into the engine, how to, pl how to work with it. So many prototypes which will just validate that you are able to make the game. Okay, so basically, I would like to uh, show you a pre-alpha teaser from our game, uh, which we are working on. Uh, it's a bit older. We are already having much uh, more beautiful graphics at this point, but uh, we are not showing it today. But uh, just to show you what, what, what's uh, in stock with CB software. porodila Jak ho porodila do vody hodila Jak ho porodila do vody hodila Ej, jej, kamarádka sa na ňu dívá So uh, this was uh, our game about what happens when your daughter doesn't come home. And uh, at this point, uh, I think we should open QA. But your microphone is not working. And then I'll come with the mic. Anyone? So maybe I start. Uh, 
Uh, how difficult is it to develop a title such as someday you'll return in two man team for three different platforms? Uh, that's basically, first of all, the engine choice and secondly, the uh, time stretching choice. So we don't plan to release all three platforms at one point because it's, n it's impossible. If we would like to do it, we would need a s kind of really big QA team for, uh, I mean, our quality assurance team for having really proper check of everything. So uh, this is like a planned platform and we are now talking with Sony, for example, about the PS4 release. But our main priority now is the PC build, which we are able to basically uh, release uh, as first and then we want to make the, the additional platforms. Uh, anyone? Uh, the way this game looks and the way it feels so far feels a lot like Firewatch and other games like Dear Esther or something similar. Uh, are you taking inspiration from the games? Are you playing them to see what the players like there? Or are you actually working just on your own, figuring it out? And So basically, are you insp getting inspired from the existing games or are you just working on your own? Um, Thank you, that's a very good question. I uh, basically uh, start game like this from a story. So that's basically the story is the first, the medium is the second. I originally thought this game would be something like Firewatch, but then I played Firewatch and found find out that our game, unfortunately for many people, would be much more interactive. So basically there is much more to do, there is much more to fiddle with uh, in the game. Because in Firewatch basically the interaction is more about the uh, radio and about very simple things and it's not very challenging in tem terms of gameplay. So uh, my, uh, so my, uh, I love Firewatch of course, the game is really great, but it's a different cup of game. And Dear Esther is Walking Simulator, or for example, Vanishing of Ethan Carter, even if it's kind of, uh, uh, has some puzzle elements, still has this walk, Walking Simulator feel. And we are trying to make the game kind of filled with things you have to do, which is maybe the main dis difference. But what's the uh, same is that we are really, uh, the story comes first, and the story is very long and very complicated, and very, uh, very deep, because it's uh, also very personal. Any other question? Uh, do you have any experience working for the big game companies or were you always an indie developer? I always worked for small companies. Uh, I twice almost landed with the job with the bigger things. First, uh, first doing soundtrack for Lost Paradise from SoCal game, which I don't know, probably nobody knows know about. And second, I, uh, there was, I, my name was on the table in one of the AAA titles. But uh, eventually, I always work with a lot of indies, like even different studios, and help them getting their games out there. So I personally am signed under, I don't know, 20 games from other, other studios in different roles. OK, I guess that we have run out of time. So thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. You. I would like to thank you for inviting and for this great place. Uh, one last thing, please, we don't outsource.